Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, wow. You know, <laughs> it's just so cool to have an actual, like, real live audience, real people with real faces. Okay, eyes mostly, but... All right, guys, I would like you to meet Steve. This is Steve. Say hi to Steve. Hi, Steve. So, Steve, this is not his real picture, of course, but Steve is a real person. Uh, he exists in reality. He is a mathematician. He has a special knowledge in cryptography. He has a PhD in graph theory. And he's uh, 54 years old now, and he lives in Staffordshire, England, which is near Birmingham. He works as a software developer, and Steve is really good at his job. So that means his day job isn't exactly just nine to five. Yeah? And he also loves his job, which is why he has a little side project of his own, little open source project that he started a few years ago. And uh, this open source project has to do with cryptography, has to do with online, um, with internet security, online communication. And well, at first, you know, a few people found out about it and used it in their projects, and then a few more, and then it was finally a few dozen projects, and then a few hundred, a few thousand, and now it's literally millions of projects that use Steve's tool. So um, Steve started to work more and more and more. Yeah, this was all in the evenings and on the weekends and some more and some more. So you can imagine he started to work a lot. Now, he was the only maintainer, the only code maintainer for this project until another guy, coincidentally also named Steve, joined. The second Steve was actually more of a uh, so business project manager kind of guy. Very helpful, but he didn't actually do code reviews. That was still this Steve's uh, job. Okay, So in uh, 2012, uh, a German student from the University of Münster contributed some code to Steve's project. Steve reviewed it, accepted it into the code base, and was happy with it. Uh, unknown at the time that this did introduce, indeed, a bug that was only revealed and made public in 2014. And when it was found out, it was a really uh, it was a big problem. It was the single largest breach in internet security, compromising passwords and sending governments and companies scrambling. This project is called OpenSSL, and you probably have heard of it, yeah? And in 2014, this was the uh, so-called heart bleed bug uh, that was revealed. And only then did this project get some attention and people were actually curious, who are actually the maintainers behind this project? And then they found out, oh, it's these two Steves. Yeah? And then this gave rise to f sort of funny headlines like this. The uh, internet is being protected by two guys named Steve. I mean, one was Steve, one was Steve Venn, actually. right? But, uh, so the two Steves. And they were these two underpaid, overworked uh, guys who just, you know, yeah, took care of our, of our uh, internet security. All right, so <laughs> you've probably all seen uh, this. We just saw it in a talk earlier by Thomas, right? And uh, this depicts a very typical situation. I mean, it's, I know it's been used a lot, this picture, but it's still, it's just spot on, right? In software, you know, one building block builds upon the other, and then you get to a situation where you have this one small piece of software, and if you remove it, it all comes crashing down, and we're going to spend a long time reassembling civilization from the rubble, right? And so this is what happened with OpenSSL, and this kind of thing happens again and again. The OpenSSL was really, really grave, and of course, you all remember Lock for a Shell. Obviously, I don't need to go into this. This is just very recent. It was the same situation, right? The only difference being with Open, uh, uh, with Lock for J. It was actually three guys who were the main maintainers, and they are not. They don't have the same name. They were called, uh, or are called, uh, Ralph, Matt, and uh, Gary, right? Okay, but essentially it's the same thing. So uh, this presents a bit of a problem. And in the talk by uh, Thomas Fricke just now, we heard he, he gave us a few more examples of, of uh, open source projects that are maintained by one or two people. All right. So, what can we do? Well, there is a few things that we can do. Uh, one, for example, would be 
uh, go and contribute to these projects, right? Contribute code. Doesn't have, to, doesn't have to be only code. You can contribute, contribute documentation or UI, UX stuff. Anything helps, yeah? We ask our developers at Mercedes-Benz, please contribute high quality code or make high quality contributions. Why? Because obviously, you know, if you contribute stuff that isn't thought through and that is not good, then it creates even more of a burden on the maintainers. This is also not to say, however, if you're a newbie and it's your first contribution, like, oh no, I can't do this. No, please do it anyway. The maintainers are usually nice people and they welcome any contribution. But what I mean is high quality, well, as good as you can. But don't just, you know, throw random stuff at them and he's like, here, you know, this, this needs to be in, but you can work it out, okay? Not like that, a bit more diligence, all right? High quality diligence. So now it turns out um, the number of contributions that OpenSSL was getting was never the problem. At any given point in time, they had about 200 contributions at least waiting to be reviewed by Steve. Yeah, so the number of contributions wasn't the problem. Uh, it was, you know, the, the bottleneck Steve, he was the only guy, or the two Steves, but you know, for code, it was only the one Steve. So um, you could, for example, it would be extremely helpful, become a maintainer for a project, right? If, you're, if this is a project that you use a lot and maybe you have already done some contributions and you know the code well, maybe you can become a maintainer. That would really help Steve, right? become the third Steve, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so become a maintainer. Now, obviously, not everyone here does have the time. You can be a maintainer for 10 other open source projects. Uh, but, you know, as I said, if, if you're already familiar with the project, you use it a lot, why not become a maintainer? Think about it. That would really help. So if you can't be a maintainer, what else can you do? Well, okay, simple. You can just actually maybe donate give them uh, some money, provide funding. How does that help? Well, so Steve had a day job that was being paid and his open source engagement wasn't paid. If Steve had enough donors and sponsors, maybe he could quit his day job and do this for real work, right? And live off of it. And maybe not just, you know, a very, very small salary, but a decent and, and an adequate salary. Right? Um, these projects need server, servers. They have costs for hardware, for all kinds of things. So they actually need money. And a lot of times these people are paying it out of their pockets as well, right? So um, that helps for funding. Okay, so funding is a good thing. I'm gonna concentrate the rest of my talk mainly on funding and how to do this. Another option, just to mention this, is foundations. Become a member of a foundation, your company, right? For example, um, we are founding members of the Eclipse Foundation. We have uh, Michael Plage here from the Eclipse Foundation. <laughs> um, we are members of the Linux Foundation, Cloud Native, and the Hyperledger Foundation. Why is that useful? Well, because foundations provide a lot of help for projects, right? Um, they, they really are also open source heroes. And, and, you know, all the Apache Foundation and so forth, right? So, uh, become a member in foundations. That, that's a good thing. As a, as a company, I mean, as a private person, uh, you can do that as well, of course. All right, so let's, let's look at funding. How to do funding. Um, there are now more and more options how you can actually get the money to the open source projects and to the developers. You know, companies, when they pay money, they somehow, they have to do it somehow. They can't just, you know, pay some random guy in the internet. Here's some money. That, it doesn't work like that. So you can go through, uh, for example, GitHub. GitHub sponsors is, has been introduced about a year and four months ago. And uh, you can, you can uh, use that to donate money to the projects. Or another option is uh, Open Collective and their open source, uh, wait, open source collective, and they're also here, recording partner, 
sponsor for this, for this foundation. So the fees, when you have to pay, uh, what you have to pay. Uh, open source takes, open source collective takes 10% uh, on incoming funds. They're a non-profit organization. That means they really use this money only for their costs. Okay, so that means if you have $1,000, you want to give $1,000 to a project, either you give $1,000 and then they will receive 900, or you give 1112 uh, to the Open Source Collective and then they will get 1,000, 10% deducted. All right, GitHub, right now, they're still doing it for free. Uh, they will introduce fees sometime this year, I expect. Uh, they don't know exactly yet how much, but it will be under 10% somehow, probably nine, <laughs> I don't know. Um, there are other options, and for example, here Linux Foundation has a crowdfunding platform. It, they, they're really good with the fees. They don't uh, take any fees for the first $10 million uh, and then 5% after that. And then, uh, whoops, here I have listed a bunch of other options. I, I'm not very familiar with these myself. I haven't like really really examined them very well. Some of them are kind of uh, niche ideas, but they may be interesting. Uh, so why not take a look, right? LibraPay, Bounty Source, Stake Social, Tide Lift, Issue Hunt, and Access Code. I don't know exactly their fee structure, okay? But so there are a lot of options out there now how you as a company, or actually even as a private person, can uh, donate money, okay? So we, have, we are uh, partners with GitHub, we use GitHub for uh, our software development, and we have started donating money to the open source projects. Uh, right now, we're sponsoring, well, 27 organizations and developers. So it could be yeah, an organization, it could be an individual developer. Here are just some curl, fiber, Sinner Sohus, I don't know if you know this guy, he's one of the really big open source heroes. He has hundreds of projects, he's really cool. And he lives off of it. He has enough projects and enough funding now that this is his actual job, right? He does his own open source stuff and he receives enough money from a lot of uh, companies and people that he can actually live off this. So this is good, he, he's true here. OpenSSL, we have started funding them as well. And uh, Log4j, we're funding them also now, right? So, because it makes sense, right? So, now, I would like to tell you a little bit about how you actually do this, because up until now, it all sounds easy, right? But when you now think, okay, this is a great idea, I want to do this in my company, and you go to your company and your, your financial people, and you say, hey, I want to pay uh, X amount of money to this open source project, then they're going to say, uh-huh, okay, so wait a minute. It's not so easy because the, you have to set up all the processes. It's easier in small companies, and the bigger the company, the more difficult it gets, because the processes are more... <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, uh, in general, the idea, how it works is like this. So we give money to GitHub, and then GitHub gives the money to open source developers or projects, and uh, takes a deduction or not. GitHub doesn't, as I said, not yet, but uh, will soon. Okay, this is the money flow. But now, as a company, when you want to implement this, I struggled a long time really setting this up. So I would like to give you some insights, some, maybe some pointers if you want to do this as well. So when a money pays company, when a company <laughs> pays money to somebody, they usually do it either uh, through a purchase order or uh, through a classical sponsorship, right? So purchase order, you buy something, right? It, whatever it is, it, it can be a, a, you know, a screw, a part, something small, something big. Uh, it could be a supplier, a, um, whatever. Uh, what, what is the word I'm looking for? A consultant, thank you. So you buy something, you pay money. Fair enough. The other way to get rid of your money as a company is a classical sponsorship. So for example, Mercedes-Benz sponsors athletes for wearing our logo on their sleeve, right? Famous athlete, it's nice, he's on, he or she's on television, you know, Mercedes-Benz is like, oh, nice, so we pay them money. That works as well. But now what is open source sponsorship? It's called sponsorship, but is it, is it actually sponsorship? Not really, because 
the person is not wearing our logo anywhere. I mean, maybe it shows up on their GitHub profile. OK, fine. But it's just it's not classical sponsorship. At the same time, we're also not buying something. We're not going to these open source developers and tell them, hey, we give you money, we want to support you, but you have to implement a feature for us. Right? It doesn't work like that. And even if it did work like that, then we need to sign a contract with this guy. Uh, he might be working in South Africa. Now, OK, we can wire money to South Africa, but we need to set up a contract with him. Yeah, we have to have a supplier relation with this guy. And he might be anywhere in the world. We might, even not, not, we might not even know where in the world, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's really difficult. And now, you have to talk to the people in your company who are responsible for sponsoring or, and are responsible for purchasing. In the case of Mercedes-Benz, it gets really complicated because you know, sp purchasing in itself is a big, big division. Yeah, purchasing parts and purchasing software and purchasing anything, yeah? Uh, so you need to find out who's the right person, and then and then you kind of get pushed around. He's the right person. Now he's the right okay. Then oh, but it's uh, GitHub sponsors. You need to talk to the people from sponsoring. And it's like okay, good. I'll talk to them. And they're like, yeah, but this doesn't sound like sponsoring. You're buying something, so it's purchasing. You know, and so you're gonna get in, go in circles. The thing is because it doesn't fit any existing process. Right, and so you have to figure out a way. You have to talk to all these people, make sure they're on board, and then you can finally decide: okay, we're either going to establish our new process for open source, or we will call it purchasing, or we will call it sponsoring. Okay, either is fine. New process usually is really complicated. Um, sponsoring, yeah, why not? Purchasing, why not? As long as it fits whatever. Uh, it fits your, your, your purpose, okay? But I'm just saying it can get complicated, okay? And another thing it, that you need to pay attention to is compliance, all right? When a company pays money to somebody, you want to make sure you know who this person is because you don't want to finance some dark channels and then it ends up in the press and says Mercedes-Benz is sponsoring the dark net of evilness or something, yeah? Um, so that's why when we pay money to someone, to anyone, we check their names against sanction lists. Yeah, there's a system and you type in the name and then it comes back green or red. If it's red, you have to actually look closer into it. Doesn't necessarily yet mean this person is evil, but hmm, check. Green is good. But now, that's, by the way, banks, everybody does this, right? But if I want to pay money to Anna, I need, so I punch her name, Anna Jimenez Santa Maria, into the system, and then the system comes back. But in order to do that, I have to ask for her permission. Anna, is it okay that I put your name in our system? Yeah, I have to ask you for permission. Is it okay? I have to tell you exactly why I'm doing this. And I have to give you the right to revoke your consent as well. Okay? So, but now the thing is, open source developers, yeah, you don't know their names a lot of times, right? because they have like whatever username that maybe a lot of times they do reveal their real name, but a lot of times they don't. And so now I go to GitHub and I say, dear GitHub, I want to sponsor these people, uh, but I need to have their contact information so I can ask them for permission that I put them in the sanction list check, right? But now GitHub tells me, huh, Wolfgang, that's really great. That's really kind of you, but we cannot give you the names of these people because of data protection laws, right? GitHub, with these, with these guys, signs, you know, they have a, they have a contract, or like the, the uh, user uh, regulations, and they, they say, we will not give your name to a third party. And we are now a third party. We want to give them money, fine, but we're a third party. So GitHub says, <laughs> sorry, can't help you there. Yeah. Okay, what's a way out? I mean, a way out would be GitHub will change their uh, regulations and tell the users, hey, if 
you, if somebody wants to sponsor you, uh, then we will ask you for permission if we can give the names to the company. Okay, that's a possibility, and but that wasn't implemented yet because we, you know, we were one of the first companies that started this with GitHub, the, the GitHub sponsors thing, and so. I just had to go there and find these people's names. So some had their name, okay, fine. They, but then I had, I had to send them an email. I couldn't just use their name and punch it into the sanctionless check system because as I said, I have to ask their permission. So if they don't publish their email address on GitHub, you know, then how do I get in touch with them? Well, sometimes I found them on LinkedIn and I said, hey, can I send you an email, please? Uh, sometimes. Uh, they had their email there. Sometimes I just placed an issue on GitHub. I said, hey, we would like to sponsor you. Can we talk? Can you send me an email, please? You know, and so that way I did get a hold of all of these people, but it was really complicated. Yeah, every git commit has an email. Um, every git commit has an email. Unless it's hidden, because you can hide it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think every, I don't know. Yeah. I'll check it out, but... Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I can tell you, we tried all kinds of ways. In the, in the end, we got there, but it was actually complicated. Okay. So um, um, these are just things you have to think about. That's sort of my main message at this point. Uh, because at first we thought, yeah, we're just going to do this. It's great, yeah? And then you get to the details, and then these things come up. Yeah, but you can't just put their name into a sanction list check because you have to ask their permission. It's like, oh, God, what else, right? Okay, but in the end, it's all good. Hmm. So. Um, now that I had the, the email addresses of these people and they had mine, you know, they uh, gave me feedback when we sponsored them. And here's just a few, a few things of feedback. So uh, here, I'm humbled by the fact that people found out about my project and actually use it. They weren't aware, they're like, eh, it's just there, but nobody uses it. No, we use your project. Oh, and then even that, oh, and even Mercedes-Benz uses my project. Wow, how cool. Um, thanks, it really gave me the kick I needed to continue working and that good feeling one gets from contributing to something. And this helps the team to be even more motivated to increase the quality of the project. Uh, thank you again for the recognition. I'm also receiving a lot of contributions from your team, which I greatly appreciate. Or here's one more. We're very happy to get this sponsorship and hope it will open up all sorts of new avenues for collaboration. So this is really good, right? After you, know, you, know, you do all this and you go through this and then you get this feedback, it's like, good, it, it reaches its goal hopefully, and, and makes people happy. What is more than the money that they received, I think is the pat on the shoulder they got, the reward, the recognition, yeah? Of course, you can't buy bread with you know, thin air, thank you. But I think the people, they were really, they were more happy for the recognition and for, for the, uh, yeah, the pat on the shoulder. So that was, that was really nice. Okay, so, so far so good. We are uh, continuing the sponsorships. Um, how, do we, how do we find out the projects? Which projects do we sponsor? Um, well, we asked our developers, we asked our own internal community. So we made calls. It's like, guys, we're going to do this. Who should we sponsor? Which projects do you use in your projects? Uh, which open source people you think are uh, need sponsorship, like sponsorship? Are, wh who are your heroes? Which is the software that we depend upon? Which is the software that powers our world, right? And uh, so we made these announcements. Hey, please tell us. And then we got lots and lots of ideas. And not all of them were sponsorable or sponsorable yet. Right? They hadn't set up a GitHub sponsorship profile. Uh, they were on another platform. We don't currently support Open Source Collective yet, but I plan to do this in the future. But now you've got a little bit of an idea why this is kind of a complicated thing for a new platform, but we'll try anyway, right? Um, 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 
Yeah, so we got feedback. Of, uh, we, we also had a project that we want to sponsor, and they said, you know, it's okay. We don't want to receive sponsorship. We're open source, and we do this for free as a hobby. Let's keep it that way. Right? That's the exception, because usually people aren't too uh, heartbroken when you give them money. <laughs> right? But... Uh, but some are like, no, it's okay. Some also, by the way, had uh, some, like one or two, two, no, two projects that we wanted to sponsor. They said, we can't accept sponsorship in our country where we live because uh, we have a tax problem when we just receive money. Yeah? So that means there's some work to do, maybe for the governments, uh, maybe for the providers of the sponsorship, GitHub, for example, or Open Collective. Yeah, but so there are some roadblocks still, but for the main part, it's uh, going very well, I think. All right, so um, to wrap this up, here's just a little, if you want to find out more about our open source way at Mercedes-Benz, you can go to opensource.mercedes-benz.com or Google it. Uh, this is our open source landing page. We just took it online a few months ago, so it's there's not that much content there yet. We're working on it, published some articles. You can see our, um, own, our own open source projects that we are publishing. Uh, there aren't that many yet, just a few, but we're adding more and more as we go along. Right? It's, just, it's a start. Uh, you can read our Mercedes-Benz FOSS manifesto that I think sh could be quite interesting for you. This is our commitment basically to be open, to be a completely open source savvy company. And um, in the manifesto, we, you know, it has two parts. It has a company part and an employee part. And the company part says, we as a company, we want to support open source. So we encourage all our employees, please become active members of open source. Contribute, create, uh, and use open source become members of a foundation, go to a conference, give a talk perhaps, yeah, something like that. All right, uh, all on this open source landing page. So if you like it, give us uh, your feedback. If you don't like it, also give us your feedback. <laughs> and I uh, hope you find something useful there. All right, that's it. I can, I would like to send you off encouraging you, go to your companies and Think about whether open source, open source sponsorship would be something that you can do as well. Uh, I think it would drive forward open source as a whole very much. So do it, okay? Thank you for listening and, and uh, may there always be wind in your sails. I had to do a pirate reference, yeah, something. Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. So, oh, let's start here then. Uh, thank you very much. This is really enlightening. I have two questions. One is, uh, what was the process to decide your man to, to convince your management to hand out money without any direct return of invest? And can you disclose the orders of magnitude of uh, sponsorship that you're doing? Like, I don't know, 10% of your revenue or whatever? <laughs> It's more like 25. You know. um, so first of all, how did we get this through? Well, the, the opportunity rose up with GitHub sponsors. GitHub approached me and said, hey, we're doing GitHub sponsors program, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to be part of it? And I said, yes, great. Um, and then I had the fortunate possibility to, with one step of indirection, talk to our CIO. Uh, at Mercedes-Benz, and he said, wow, that's a great idea, let's do it. Yeah, no return on investment is true, but he is very convinced that open source is the right thing to do. We have open source in our IT strategy, have had it for a few years now, four years or so, I think. And so he is convinced, you don't need to convince him anymore that open source is a sensible thing and the way to go. So return on investment, thank God, I didn't have to you know, present the case. This is, because actually, uh, you can present this, you probably know this. There is you know, a, a good return on investment in open source. Uh, let me think, let me think. I forget the source, but somebody just recently mentioned a, a research where it's, uh, it, it pays back twice, right? 
So there is a return, but, but okay. We, I had a short way to the CIO and he said, let's do it. And then, and then that was it, so, all right. Order of magnitude, uh, I, I don't want to disclose that information. You know why? Because um, we're just starting, so I think it's a nice sum, but somebody could say, oh, that's really nice, Mercedes, but that's a nice sum, good job, Mercedes, yeah? And somebody else could say, that's zero point something percent of your revenues. You're, tch, you can do much more. Yes, we can do much more for sure. But so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to either side really. That's why I, I can tell you, as I said, membership in foundations is one way that tends to be really expensive. You can, you can look that up. How much, I, is it okay that I mention how much it, yeah? So if you're, we're a strategic member of the Eclipse Foundation, that's 250,000 euros a year. So, for example, right, for sponsorship, we're below that still. We're, we're working on it, right? But, um, okay. All right. So, first off, a plug. If you want to be a platinum sponsor for the Apache Software Foundation, it's half of that. It's Sorry? If you want to be a platinum sponsor for the Apache Software Foundation, it's like half of that. Oh. <laughs> So um, putting that one aside, you mentioned Log4j and that you were sponsoring Log4j. Um, since that's an Apache project, I was curious how you went about doing specifically Log4j. Oh, why we specifically did Log4j? Why? How? How? Well, we found out who are the main... Can Log4j itself doesn't have a GitHub sponsors profile right. set up. It's an Apache project. But the three main developers have a sponsorship profile, and so we picked the three developers and pick them as re recipients of the sponsorships. Okay. Ralph and Gary and uh, Matt. Okay. So if you wanted to do a targeted sponsorship for the Log4j project, that is also possible through mm -hmm. it. It is? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thanks, for that. Thanks for that information. Thanks. I, I would have a follow-up question to the targeted sponsorship, maybe with lead to this discussion, because I'm a part of another Apache project and we got the targeted sponsorship, but we got the restriction to not spend it on development work, but just on infrastructure, testing devices and stuff like this. So we found it really tricky to do something with the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that <laughs> can be. As I said, we had like uh, one project that said, sorry, we, I don't even know what to do with the money. And, oh, and another one they said, you know, I'm doing this, I work for an IT company and they're paying me for, do, for, for this, so I don't need sponsorship, thanks. I've, I have a bit of a different question or base for another discussion. I mean, the evening is long today. Um, and um, do we have the danger of getting in a two-class open source society where mm. some projects are exposed enough. I mean, open SSL and Log4J in the end might come out as winners in that sense that yeah. people know them now and may give them money for their work, but there are thousands of other people in Nebraska that, that uh, thanklessly maintain other projects <laughs> we rely on. And Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> which, which leads to the follow-up question. We, we just had it in a discussion before. If, if, there, if we may need something like the GEMA, mm -hmm. the Germans may know the GEMA. Uh, <laughs> well, the GEMA is not directly associated with some, some, something sympathetic, but that's the way how m musicians get money for their music that's played in the radio. Right. Because not everybody in the radio, or if you have a club or something, pays directly to the guy due to the situation that Wolfgang mentioned. But they just take money from everybody, and some money they give back to the artists, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing, I wonder, I had a, I had a discussion some weeks ago about how open source is some kind of culture, because all those, I would say, low-impact open source projects where other built upon, you could also see as as like an effort for the for the society. So um, why isn't there a way to do a donation to them? And a donation is, for the company, it may make a pretty big difference because donations are handled totally differently yep. tax-wise. Yep. Because donation basically yeah, helps you in, in saving taxes. So uh, do we see, probably it's also a question to you, uh, I mean, do we get to the point that donations to open source projects may be seen as donations. Mm -hmm. Because this, yeah, I mean, with Apache, it is surely the case, as Apache is an NGO, and a donation to Apache is totally, like, yeah, tax-free. Tax um, because this this would well, change, probably, uh, yeah, the, the way it is seen by especially big enterprises. Yeah, that is true. Okay, so I guess that was actually three questions, Julian. 
<laughs> yeah. That's good. That's fine. I, I, I hope I can remember them. Okay, first one is, do, are we going to see a two-class two society? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I think it might happen. But, I mean, let's look at it. Only 2% of all open source projects are actually called successful or actually considered successful. So they will probably receive most of the donations. And out of those 2%, probably the majority of donations will go to 0.5%. Yeah. So I think there is that danger. Um, maybe it's an incentive for all the other open source projects that want to receive funding to just become better. Huh? Have a big CVE to get in the mainstream. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know, but um, I, I see that danger, but I don't want to actually keep that us from starting it anyway. If in five years, you know, all the big and the medium and small companies donate to open source, and then this is a problem, then we need to dis discuss and address that problem, right? Right now, I would just hope that it will do something good. Then uh, GEMA, interesting idea. I don't know what to make of it, to be honest. Um, it sounds sort of reasonable because then maybe you know, the, these open source projects that are the most successful will also receive the largest chunk of the, of the money. But then again, I think it goes a bit against open source idea you know, because free and open source software, all of a sudden it's not free anymore and I get to decide whether I want to pay for it or not, then I have to. Then it's like GEMA or even GZ is even worse, right? So, so I don't know, may, maybe not, right? And uh, now the third question, what was the third question? Donations. Donations for open source. Oh yeah, exactly. That sounds like a great idea because it would certainly, it would certainly cut down so all of this process overhead, a, a lot of it anyway, and it would be more attractive for companies because they can deduct it from taxes probably, right? That's fantastic. I can comment on uh, microphone? Yep. Yeah. Oh, Michael. <laughs> I, I just want to say I, I love this presentation. We went through Thanks. the same process working early with GitHub sponsors to see how we could move some public money into mm -hmm. open source projects. And we failed. <laughs> we, we, uh, I appreciate your persistence in moving it through, but the donations actually proved very, very challenging mm -hmm. uh, because the donations have an extra uh, accountability that comes with how that money is spent. And we never could break that down to the individual level. An additional problem is that the due diligence required to be able to report on that um, leads to in many organizations a minimum donation size whether that's 50,000 or 100,000 or $200,000, the, that became our problem. If we only wanted to move a little bit of money uh, to a developer, that was the challenge. Yep. If I wanted to move $100,000, now it was worth the time to do the diligence. And that's a very interesting kind of twist on, on the problem. Yeah. We do need to solve this, because right. to me, this is how we really are able to maintain software, because there are people willing to give money, there are organizations willing to give money, and there are public institutions willing to give money, but how do we get it to the right place when that increment is so small? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so how do you, yeah, what do you do with a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the way, so th this, this, th the donation thing is probably a good idea, because it would make it easier, I think, the process side, because I have spoken to other big companies in Germany, and they said, you know what, we wanted to do open source sponsorship, but we failed. We couldn't make it work with our processes, so we gave up. You know, and that's very sad, right? Big company, I'm not going to disclose their names, but it was like, and they said, well, how did you do this? You know, I was like, well, it took a lot of time, but in the end, I hope it's worth it. Oh, yeah. Actually, we can do it. Huh? At Apache, we can do it. We okay, can good. Yeah. Good. Send over to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that in mind then. <laughs> Thanks. Michael. Have you discussed the risks that this could all the raise problems among the community? Sorry, the risks? The risks this, is, this could raise so that people say, oh, my contributions are more valuable than your contribution. Mm. I should receive more money than you. 
Yeah. Think not, money is not always a positive thing, right? Could right. be although, have you discussed this internally before you start with sponsorship? Uh, not this particular. I mean, we have discussed risks, of course, right? Especially the risk of the money ending up in some place where you don't want it to be. Right, um, what I mentioned earlier with the sanctionless checks. Now, this kind of risk, again, it's something along the lines what Julian mentioned. It's you know, it's possible that this happens. If in a few years we see that this is a problem, we need to address it, or maybe before it becomes a problem. But right now, we just thought, okay, let's let's do it and hopefully achieve something good. You know? Right. Um, see the also with the like the dark places that you don't want the money to end up, and then your name is in the press. The same, of course, is true for GitHub, and then Stripe is their payment provider as well. So they're doing these very same sanctionless checks as well on their side because they also have zero interest that their name gets connected to a dubious uh, payment somewhere. Right. So. That's why, and, and we have to do it on top. It's like our Mercedes uh, piece. People said, yes, we have to do it on top. Maybe we can trust GitHub in the future. Actually, we have already started that we can rely because it's Stripe and GitHub. Good. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank Wolfgang. you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>